thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation from the organisers to come along to this session. I'm going to be talking uh, about the very varied career of J. Wright Forrester. I'm not going to do it just as a talk which accumulates historical events, though I think it's interesting enough on that basis. But I also think it offers us as simulators an opportunity to think about what aspirations do we need as simulators? What skills do we need? What experiences help us do our job? So in what sense is Forrester a model that we can base our work on? That at least is the idea. J. Wright Forrester is one of the great operational researchers. He is one of only 23 people who make up the I-4's OR Hall of Fame. He died last year, aged 98. Uh, this is him in 2002 in his office at MIT. He came a long way in space and in time. And I'm going to tell you about that long way. I'm going to talk about system dynamics a bit, one application in particular, but I'm actually going to concentrate on his other achievements, perhaps less well known. So he was born on the 14th of July, Bastille Day, 1918, in Nebraska. Now, uh, Nebraska is big. It's very, very big. It's actually as big as the British Isles. So Scotland, Wales and England put together. And in Nebraska, you get a great sense of space and scope and opportunity if you worked hard. Jay was born in a place called Climax, in the sand hills of Nebraska. Uh, it doesn't exist, uh, as he wrote to me a while back. Climax is now only a water well for cattle and has long since disappeared from the maps. But it's a large, large place. And Climax is actually close to a place called Arnold. So as you journey across Nebraska, you can make it back to Arnold, the closest place to where Jay was born. Here we are approaching Arnold moving into the town. Here it is, uh, it's still there. Uh, I think to understand Forrester, you have to go back, go back a bit in time. So here in 1906, four years before Forrester's parents arrived, Arnold looked like this. Here it is in 1920, Jay was two years old. This maybe gives you a sense of the place. Let's talk about his parents. His parents had a cattle ranch. Uh, here on the left, this is Marmaduke Forrester, Duke, from around when Jay was born, I think. And on the right, this is Ethel Pearl Wright, from, I, I think, some years later. And these photos are, are scans from Jay's physical originals that he pulled out. Uh, both of them were graduates from Hastings College in Nebraska, and they built a concrete block ranch house. Forrester wrote to me saying, almost all other homesteader houses in the community when this house was built were made of native sod. Ours was very much the exception with indoor plumbing and running water. As I understand it, my mother would not agree to be married unless she had a house with plumbing. Jay's parents uh, also worked as country school teachers, as well as running their ranch. So Jay was taught at home for two years by his mother, and he had a horse, Roni, who you see here. And he rode, Roni, two miles to school. There is the school. To a schoolhouse to continue his education, and there he was taught originally by his father. He enjoyed practical work on the farm. He installed a battery-powered doorbell on the farm. Uh, his turbine, which is the one on the right-hand side, brought the first electricity to the ranch. I shouldn't have said farm, it's ranch. Now, the ranch had many practical requirements, and I think those practical requirements of life on a ranch very much coloured his view throughout his whole life. Here we are in 1938. This is his last year at school. He's eating chocolate with his parents and his sister, Barbara. Agricultural college was the obvious thing for him to do. Uh, he decided not to do that. He went to the University of Nebraska and he did a BSc in electrical engineering. 
After that, the question was, what next? Well, what he did was he left the ranch to go to the frontier. He became a research assistant at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He did this for two reasons, he always said. First of all, MIT offered him more money than any other institution. And secondly, because his mother knew about MIT and knew that it was a place worth going to. This is, of course, not the MIT we know today. Uh, it's a rather different place. Though, of course, in many ways, very much the MIT we know today. Uh, Jay became the research assistant to Gordon S. Brown. And he worked on servo mechanisms. So he worked on milling machines with feedback control. Very clever stuff, very practical. From 1940, Jay was the associate director of the servo mechanisms lab at MIT. And then World War II arrived. A little bit of a divergence here. In World War II, detecting the enemy was very important, particularly when the enemy arrived in the new wonder weapon, aircraft. That's what they were at that time. Now, the story of detecting aircraft is actually central to the creation of OR. I hope you know it. Uh, but just quickly, uh, let me go over it because it's relevant for Forrester. We used to just look and listen for incoming aircraft, which is what these British guys are doing. Then two boffins came along. On the left, Robert Watson Watt developed radar, and Patrick Maynard Stuart Blackett championed it and played a central role in learning how to put it into operation to create the best air defence system in the world, which is what Britain had at the time of the Battle of Britain. Approaching aircraft would be picked up by the chain home radar stations. So information would appear on screens to be analysed by the IRF. There would also be observer posts who would triangulate the information from the radar. All of this co was coordinated, controlled centrally. And instructions sent out, a defending fighter could be sent out. Closer in, anti-aircraft guns could be deployed. Even closer in, barrage balloons could be launched so bombers couldn't go down low and get accurate targeting. All of this is relevant to operational researchers, but it's also relevant to the Americans, and therefore to Jay, because the Americans had a sim similar problem in the Pacific, detecting aircraft and protecting their ships from attack by those aircraft. More generally, their problem, which is not one the British had, was being able to use radar from a moving platform, a ship, which rolls and pitches. How do you keep your radar horizontal so it's not dipping into the ocean or going up into the sky? How do you get good information about the location of attacking aircraft on a moving platform? This is the solution, a hydraulic servo mechanism. It combined balancing loops and a reinforcing <coughs> loop. Essentially, it picked up the ship's motion, amplified it, with a reinforcing loop, and then used balancing loops to steer the radar mount as it went round. It was created by Forrester. Interestingly, Jay describes how he had trouble getting a patent for this device, because the argument from the patent office came back, no device with a reinforcing loop can possibly work, as reinforcing loops go to infinity. And that can't happen in the physical world. And he had to argue back, explaining, no, there is a reinforcing loop, but then it hits or is controlled by a balancing loop. We will come back to that idea. Now, this is the one uh, in the J.W. Forrester conference room at MIT. An admiral saw it visiting MIT and said, no, I need this. And Jay said, yes, we'll be producing them as soon as possible. And the admiral said, no, I need this one, and I need it right now. So the experimental device was mounted on the Lexington, an aircraft carrier, and this is in early 1943. It worked well. Lexington went off to the Pacific. The device apparently had developed some problems subsequently. Jay flew across the United States of America all the way to Pearl Harbor to repair the device, and he offered to stay on when the Lexington was deployed to battle. So the device did work in battle, aircraft were detected far out. Forrester and the ship ended up in the campaign to retake the Marshall Islands, and off Tarawa Island, the Lexington was torpedoed. I think some of its screws were damaged and its uh, rudder was hit very, very badly. It had trouble getting home. It limped home with that damaged rudder. Um, 
Jay talks about that experience of being attacked by Japanese aircraft, uh, torpedoes and so forth, saying, the experience gave a very concentrated immersion in how research and theory are related to practical end use. Right, so clever, very practical, and rather courageous. So what now? ASCA. The Aircraft Stability and Control Analyzer. This is a US Navy project aimed to develop an aircraft flight simulator capable of testing designs that are yet to be built. So it used wind tunnel data about the designs, processed that data via a computer to predict how the aircraft would handle. And here you see Bob Everett, another key figure in ASCA, test flying a design. So this is perhaps, as you know about system dynamics, is a little bit like test flying an organization. Now, the original idea here was to use analog technology. But Forrester came to believe that only digital technology would be adequate to the task. So in 1946, research was redirected towards the development of a high-speed digital computer able to generate real-time simulations. And this led to Project Whirlwind, the world's first real-time digital computer. This is 1947. Project Whirlwind moved to MIT's BATA building and the computer occupied 250 square meters on the second floor. So this is one of those computers that you can climb a ladder and walk around in. This is 1950, this is Whirlwind 1. And here you see uh, Stephen Dodd, Jay Forrester, Robert Everett and Ramona Ferencz. In 1951, funded by the US Department of Defense, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory was created. The whirlwind researchers moved to Division VI. The computer was used to experiment with designs for military information systems. Early demonstrations showed that whirlwind could analyze radar data supplied by telephone line, track an approaching bomber, and direct an interceptor aircraft. Furthermore, as Jay was very proud to say, this was done only with, quotes, 1,024 bytes of memory. Not megabytes, not kilobytes, just bytes. Now, I've now got Forrester in front of the whirlwind computer in the MIT Digital Computer Lab. Now, there's lots of video in the, of Jay when he's older in recent years, but I wanted you to see him when he was younger. Uh, this jumps ahead a little in time because it's actually him being interviewed by Boston's Channel 7 in 1957, <coughs> uh, but I wanted to show you this. Also, we as computer simulators might rather like this. Sure. So not too much of Jay, but you get a sense of what computing was like and you've seen Jay when young. So this led to a new frontier a management information system for defense, SAGE, the Semi-Automatic Ground Environment. SAGE was supposed to defend the airspace over Canada and the United States of America from attack by Soviet Union bombers. It was a network of digital computers and a long-distance communication system which sent tracking <coughs> data, target tracking information from radar stations to computers. This allowed the operators to deploy fighter aircraft and surface air missiles in response to perceived threats. Whirlwind was what was needed at the heart of this system. Here is Whirlwind again in 1952, and behind many of those flat panels were electrostatic storage tubes. Hundreds of them. No, no, there's no problem at all. All right, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Behind many of those flat panels, you see the electrostatic storage tubes, hundreds of them. Uh, they work fine for a university research tool, uh, though they did wear out frequently and were quite expensive. Uh, but for a military information system, they were hopelessly unreliable. So to address this problem, Jay got thinking. This is his notebook from June the 13th, 1949. And actually, he's looking at hysteresis in a material. And these are his notes on magnetic storage for memory. This work spurred Forrester and some colleagues to create coincident current magnetic core memory, created in 1949, patented in 1956. It was faster. It was more efficient. It was more reliable. The patent for this memory 
or is the highest earning patent that MIT has ever had. As a result of this, Forrester was inducted into the US Inventors Hall of Fame. This key innovation in computer technology was, for 20 years, the industry standard for memory, and it went to the moon with the Apollo missions. So, by 1953, no tubes. Instead, Whirlwind had sheets of magnetic core memory, and now Whirlwind was ready to be part of SAGE. Jay became the head of the MIT Digital Computer Division, and he managed the project of making a production version of Whirlwind, which became the FS Cube 7. The core of SAGE was this 275-tonne IBM FS Q7, essentially the next generation whirlwind and the first computer produced in volume. Uh, this is a photo from 1957. By the late 1950s, SAGE was working. Uh, what did it do? I have a little film of that. There we go. This illustrates what it does. So you see radar signals being sent out, information being sent back, aircraft being sent out, and more monitoring going on in this rather old-fashioned film. Let's go back to... Go. Right. What you have is attacking aircraft being identified by radar, and all of this information is processed by dozens of IBM FSQ7 computers. Forrester helped build these, and they ran the largest computer program then written. The information was coordinated in direction centers. That's what you see up the right. From here, you could direct various responses. When the attacking aircraft were far out, fighters could be sent out and directed to intercept. When they were closer, radar information was sent out to direct anti-aircraft missiles. So that's a direction center, and here is one of the FSQ-7 computers sitting inside. Data was presented to operators as real-time displays on cathode ray tubes, with some input coming from this light pen pointing device. Key innovations in interactive computing here. Uh, here is the screen that the operators saw, and you could point at targets and get more information about them. And here, is the SAGE control room. The last SAGE computer center was decommissioned in 1983. SAGE operated for 25 years. The individual centers were operational for 99.8% of the time. So they were out of operation for, I think that's 17 hours per year. And Jay and his colleagues were always very, very proud of that level of operational uptime. So what now? off to the frontier. In 1956, Alfred, Alfred Sloan created the MIT Sloan School, a management school at a technical university. And Forrester became a professor at Sloan, the first technical professor. And he looked around and said, well, what am I going to do with this opportunity? And he famously talked about, well, there's the area of information systems. That might have something to do with management. But I think information systems is kind of done. You know, nothing interesting is going to happen for the next 10 years or so. Or so. so I'm not interested in that. Then he looked at operational research and made these famous remarks about it. He said, let's see if I can get it right, that he thought that operational research paid its way, but that it didn't make the difference between whether an organization failed or succeeded. Okay. Then GEC's appliance factories contacted him and said, our factories are experiencing oscillations in inventories, workforce, and profitability. Jay used his servo mechanism ideas to create a broad brush paper and pencil model. It had feedback loops, it had stocks of inventories and people, and it represented the guiding policies that were in operation. And what he, thought, what he discovered was that the, opera, the, the oscillations were not market volatility, i.e. exogenous, being pulled into the system. They were actually endogenously generated by the structure and guiding policies of the system. In other words, he found the Bullwick effect, also called the Forrester effect. He then did simulations, which confirmed his insights. And best of all, you could calm the oscillations if you used new policies. And this was his aha moment. Servo mechanism ideas apply to social systems. 
1958, he published a Harvard Business Review article called, modestly, Industrial Dynamics, a Major Breakthrough for Decision Makers. You'll be familiar with system dynamics, I think, in this group, but think about the underlying ideas being brought into play here. You have an electrical engineer familiar with the idea of currents flowing down wires or accumulating, charge accumulating in capacitors. You have the servo mechanism engineer, feedback loops used for control. You have the ASCA computer engineer, simulations help you experiment with designs. And it's now all coming together. Jay had found what he could do at Sloan, create a new field. This is the book that did it, 1961, Industrial Dynamics, and you see the GEC oscillations on the cover. The book is dedicated to Susan, his wife. The name change from Industrial Dynamics to System Dynamics came in, 19, in the mid-1960s to generalise the ideas. And what is it? What is this new thing? I'll go quiet and let Jay tell you. It's that. Jay described the field in various ways. Here's one. It's got three ideas underlying it. Feedback. You've seen him use feedback before. The idea of simulation. You see where that comes from. And the idea of mental models. This is, I think, significant. Um, the idea that you build a model with a client, closely with a client. The client plays with the model. The client learns with the model. I think people understate the importance of this third idea when they think of system dynamics. I frequently see system dynamics described or thought of as very technical, just a set of ordinary differential equations. And these ideas of working with groups are portrayed as a new development. They are not. They are there in industrial dynamics from the very beginning. It's become much easier to implement this idea in the last couple of decades, but the idea is there in the beginning. So we have ideas about group model building, participatory model building, mental models, and so forth, all there in industrial dynamics 20 years before the problem structuring methods of OR come along and start looking at this from another angle. After this, we then see the development of a discipline. 1968 produces his book, Principles of Systems, a rather more mathematical analysis of feedback systems. I, I rather like that one. In 1969, John Collins, the former mayor of Boston, uh, visited MIT, or spent a year at MIT, he had the office next to Jay, and they got talking about the growth and stagnation of cities and how these could be understood. This led to the urban dynamics work and the urban dynamics book. Why do cities grow? Why do they stagnate? How, how can you reinvigorate that growth? The next key thing, the one I want to say a little bit about, 1970, a model, well, of the future of the world. Forrester went to Geneva. He was invited to a meeting of the Club of Rome which was discussing what they called the problematique of mankind. And Forrester said, why don't you use system dynamics? The famous story is that on the plane back, and actually it was in the Paris to Boston stretch of the, the flight back, Forrester sketched this, this diagram out. It's his first sketch of a model that came to be called World One. That's a terrible name for a model. Uh, but what it shows is far more significant. It shows the interaction of population, natural resources, pollution, quality of life. The model is exploratory, not predictive, so the interest is not in point forecasting, but in understanding the forces underlying modes of behaviour. He spent the weekend creating this, and this is World 2. The Club of Rome, some months later, visited MIT. They learnt about system dynamics and they studied this model. 1971 is the publication of the book itself. It's dedicated to Gordon, <coughs> dedicated to Gordon Brown. Hugely popular, many, many copies sold, much misunderstood. Uh, the Volkswagen Stiftung then funded further studies uh, and this merry crew came in. Uh, and here you see left to right Jürgen Anders. Uh, Jay Forrester, Dana Meadows, Dennis Meadows, and William Berings. They published in 1972, The Limits to Growth. Even more popular, even more misunderstood, it's very interesting reading the contemporary reactions to both world dynamics 
uh, amber limits to growth. I eventually went to a neutral observer who I discovered almost by accident, Ugo Bardi. Bardi is a professor of physical chemistry at the University of Florence who has written an excellent book, The Limits to Growth Revisited, in which he describes the contemporary reactions to world dynamics and limits to growth. And he talks about how these were essentially Cassandra in the Greek myth, uh, reviled for speaking the accurate truth about the future. Very, very interesting to go back over this work. Other studies came over the decades. Um, what we discover is that the original world dynamics limits to growth workers actually stood up very well. But what I'd like to do to emphasize the importance of this work is take us back to 1971, when Forrester is writing. It's easy to forget what people thought before world dynamics, before limits to growth. One of the things they thought was that growth in the human activity footprint could continue forever. It's hard to believe this, so I want to be clear. Let's be clear. Morris Edelman, a leading energy economist from MIT, said, quote, minerals are inexhaustible and will never be depleted. A stream of investment creates additions to proved reserves, a very large in-ground inventory constantly renewed as it is extracted. How much was in the ground at the start and how much will be left at the end are unknown and irrelevant. When will the world's supply of oil be exhausted? The basic answer is never. Oxford University professor Wilfred Beckerman claimed that there is, quote, no reason to suppose that economic growth cannot continue for another 2,500 years. Economist Julian Simon assured us that, quote, we now have in our hands, in our libraries really, the technology to feed, clothe and supply energy to an ever-growing population for the next 7 billion years. And finally, Carl Kaysan, government advisor, doyen of economics at Harvard, and before you wonder, I tracked this one down and found the original article, it's true, said that by some calculations, the Earth's available matter and energy could support a population of around 3.5 trillion people, all living at American standards of affluence. I'm saying this because I think all of us here live in a post-world dynamics world. Today, we have an idea that we are consuming some things that are finite. We cannot grow forever. There are limits. This is a bit like the patent argument that Jay had about the servo mechanism that steered the radar. A reinforcing loop must eventually reach a balancing loop, one balancing loop, right? one of many. The image here is, of course, wrong because you don't consume it and it's gone. Um, in fact, there's a lot of renewing of resources, um, but it's like catching fish. Um, like <coughs> catching fish, you can't take out at a, greater, at a rate greater than the replenishment rate. Right? But even so, there's stuff that once you've used it, it's kind of gone. Uh, and Jared Diamond says this. In contrast to trees and fish, oil, metals and coal are not renewable. They don't reproduce, sprout, or have sex to produce baby oil droplets or coal nuggets. So not everything grows again. So we'd have to recycle. But, but, we cannot escape the balancing loops. There are a lot of them out there, and we have a choice. If we think about the limits that matter and choose them wisely and early, we can get things to a good and stable equilibrium. Otherwise, if we overfish, we may seriously damage the resource base, allow other limits to dominate, and overshoot and collapse to an unhappy equilibrium. Forrester's world dynamics work and all of the limits to, the limits to growth work that followed gave us these insights. They are seen as, the key, as key works of the environmental movement. World dynamics is described as the founding work of global modelling. It's like the situation at GEC with their oscillations. The problem is not external. The behavior that we will all live through is endogenously generated. It is created by us. It's in our hands, and the choice is ours. That is Forrester's insight from this work. That brings us, actually, to another criticism 
of world dynamics, it's a model without an owner, which we know is a bad thing. We need a client. As simulators, we know we need someone to own the model, preferably someone who owns the problem. With world dynamics, no one owns the model, uh, so no one, no one owns the problem. But actually, that's not a flaw. It's another of the achievements of Forrester with the world dynamics work, because the problem is still real. With world dynamics, Forrester unearthed a problem that did not have an owner and challenged, his, uh, challenged us all to find an owner for that problem. And we're still working on that. Back to system dynamics. The System Dynamics Society was founded in 1983, as many of you will know. It does a lot. There are conferences, there are journals, there are university courses, there are workshops, there are winter camps, there are chapters across the world working in different areas. There's lots going, going on. There are many stars in heaven. System dynamics is applied to business strategy, to public policy, to sustainability, to human resource management, to a vast range of areas. The field celebrated its 60th year at its conference in Boston this summer. But back to Jay. After he retired, Jay had two continued interests. First of all, an interest in economics. We all know the economy is a complex thing. Jay spent many years working on something called the national model. Uh, we saw various snippets of it in, in published articles and in presentations. For example, this model is able to reproduce stagflation and give an explanation for it. Uh, there is a book, apparently. People have seen it. I have not. Uh, that book was never published, interestingly. There are different stories about why that is, that Jay didn't get it up to his level of standards that he wanted to go out into the world with. But that project does continue uh, within System Dynamics. Erling Moxness is doing very interesting work connecting System Dynamics to economics. Within economics, you see an interest in System Dynamics ideas. James Tobin, this is the James Tobin of Tobin Tax, uh, is interested in System Dynamics. He got the Nobel Prize in 1981. And he talks about the Yale approach to monetary and financial theory has been, has been widely used in empirical flow of funds studies and in modeling international capital movements. Our approach also explicitly recognizes the stock flow dynamics of saving, investment, and asset accumulation, as in my 1981 Nobel lecture. Without these effects, macro stories about policies and other events are incomplete. Forrester worked heavily on this. He also worked on the K through 12 project. K here is kindergarten. This is about bringing system dynamics ideas into schools and even earlier. Uh, it produced a string of materials dedicated for young people that Jay advised on. Jay always enjoyed working with young people. Here he is with some high school students. Uh, and he enjoyed supporting activities relating to children across the age range. This is important because for him, system dynamics and policy design was not for an elite. Jay believed that everyone could gain an appreciation for complex dynamic systems, the complex dynamics of natural and human systems, and then use their insights to create a better world. And he wanted as many people as possible to be involved in that. What was he like? Well, he was tall. Uh, he was very clearly spoken. He was quite funny. He could tell a good joke, and he could tell a good joke about himself, too. He liked being challenged. Uh, if you know Ansoff and Sleven's paper about industrial dynamics in 1968 in management si science, there's a response to Ansoff and Sleven by Jay, which is one of the best statements of what system dynamics is you will ever read. When challenged, he responds well. Nordhaus's attack on the world dynamics work produced... Forrester's paper in response, which is a brilliant, detailed critique of Nordhaus's critique of world dynamics. He was always willing to defend if criticised, and I think that's because he had thought things through carefully before he said the first thing. He was also always willing to say that something wouldn't work if he thought it wouldn't work. Uh, he wasn't closed-minded. I remember very early on, after I met him in the early 90s, I asked him in a public lecture if he'd recommend any situation, if he could think of any situation in which he would recommend not using system dynamics. And he immediately cited three areas. 
This is quite interesting because, well, like many techniques, you do find people who seem to think that systems dynamics is the solution to everything. Jay didn't. He was also curious. He got curious about soft OR in the early 90s. He could see what it could do. He still wanted it to help him get to a simulation model, but he could see how it might help do that. He also knew that system dynamics would change things and might change things fundamentally if used. I went to the 1990 System Dynamics Conference, and if you go through US Customs, you know you have this weird process in which they pull you out of line and question you, and this, that, and the other. And I was describing this in a little group, and Jay was present. I said I arrived at US Customs with my System Dynamics talk for the conference, and I described how I was challenged and said, so, are you carrying any material liable to bring down the government of the United States of America? <laughs> And I reported that I'd said no, but I didn't quite feel right about that. And Jay immediately said, you should have said, I certainly hope so. <laughs> uh, his wife, Susan, was clever, uh, a very kind lady too, with him for many, many years. I will end in two ways. And the two ways I think you need to understand Forrester, looking back and looking forward. I said that he came a long way in time and space. Uh, you have to go back to his roots in Nebraska. And here, I'm going to use what John and I wrote in the paper. Reflecting on his childhood in Nebraska, Jay wrote, life must be very practical. It is not theoretical. It is not conceptual without purpose. One works to get results. Throughout his life, from the sand hills of Nebraska to the MIT Servo Mechanism Laboratory, from the USS Lexington to the creation of the computer age, from industrial dynamics to world dynamics, from corporate ballrooms to elementary school classrooms, he lived a life true to those values. And this, perhaps, is the most compelling and enduring model that Jay Forrester ever built. Lastly, looking forward, I'd like to leave you with Jay talking to John, giving perhaps an aspiration we might all share. The ratio is wrong, don't worry about that. So given all that, do you have any people here who are new to the field, who are beginning their careers, or recent graduates of doctoral programs starting out on their academic career path or as a consultant? What advice would you offer to people as they pursue their career in system dynamics? Figure out a way to have courage. If you go into academia, you will be told to get the thing published and read. Journals, write for your colleagues. It's not possible to do any good. You've got to write for the public. You've got to get into those policies that have to be reversed. And you'll be in the middle of a fight. And you will have to like it if you stay there. Otherwise, I think you will find yourself in the, well, some, somebody surveyed publications of professional papers uh, a while back and concluded that on the average they had been read by one other person and it was, it was unclear to me whether that included the author and the reviewers or not. <laughs> so, uh, in other words, the headlines are full of opportunities for dramatic, insightful, powerful, So this has been a theme throughout your remarks tonight and throughout your career, uh, courage. Indeed, it's, uh, I believe, Appendix O in Industrial Dynamics, which is entitled Beginner Difficulties. And uh, the most important issue that you raise there is to have courage and tackle the most important problems. But there must have been times along the way where people threatened you or said, 
they have to give you some friendly advice if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be losing your job and your career will end here. And, uh, well, I I'm glad to keep going. I'm just sorry for those people. <laughs> Thank you very much.